Church, let's stand for the reading of the word. This service is so silent, so just turn to your neighbor and tell them, be encouraged in the Lord. <laughs> tell them that the Lord loves us and he cares for us. Now turn your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 3 and we are going to read together so that that power in that word that you're reading will heal you and comfort you and encourage you. Amen. Acts chapter 3 verse 1 to verse number 10. I will read from English Standard Version. 1, 2, 3, go. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of, of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him." Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of hearing your word, reading your word, and studying your word. We pray that by the power of this word, every heart shall be encouraged, healed, and challenged this day. I pray that, Lord, you raise us, my Father, to the level that you want us to be, my Father. I stand against every spirit of mourning in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of discouragement is cast out in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord, we sit under the anointing of your word. We pray that you may speak to us, O God, and build us from your word in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive the glory and honor for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. It is well with us. Amen. And if you believe, you can say a big amen, a louder amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So today's sermon I will be talking about acts of the believer. Matendo ya mumini, sio ya mtume. And I got that topic from the book, the fourth book in the New Testament, Acts of the Apostles, which for sure are the acts of Jesus done through the hands of the apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so this morning, we are going to be looking at a few things or a few acts that the, the, the apostles had or practiced and the things that we need to practice in our days and in our times. And so the acts of the believers, we had in the beginning, um, God had given us the, pro the prophets, the priests, uh, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, he brought Jesus, who is a fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy. And then Jesus called some men, and he called them to be with him, trained them, taught them, and released them so that they can continue with the works and the teachings of Jesus Christ. And now we are in a different era, the time of believers, where we do not have Jesus um, 
physically here. We do not have the prophets physically here. We do not have the apostles physically here. But we are here as believers to continue with the work that Jesus began to do and to teach. Praise the name of the Lord. Somebody said that the book of Acts is still being written. Ask yourself, are you part and parcel of what is being written today? And, and God is going to bless us even as we reflect on the, on the acts of the apostles and even as we learn from them and begin or continue with the acts in our present time and season. Praise the name of the Lord. And so I was looking at this scripture. Remember Jesus had given instruction to the disciples in the book of Luke. Actually, the book of Luke and the book of Acts were written by the same person. And so you find it's a continuation of what had started in, in, in the gospel. And so Jesus told the apostles, do not leave Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And these people waited in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them and they got the power to reach out to others, to go out and minister the same acts to the people that were there uh, at that particular time. So they've been waiting and they have been filled and in Acts chapter 2, you see them coming together, you see believers, uh, you know, being added to the number and the group is growing and, and you know, learning from the apostles because Peter stood to explain what had happened during the day of Pentecost and then we come to the, cha to the chapter that we have just read, uh, and, and Peter now after all this congregation, after the fellowship of believers and all that, while that was going on, they took time to go to the temple at the hour of prayer. Praise the name of the Lord. This is very interesting. Chapter 3 is very interesting. I know many people have heard sermons from chapter number 3. Many of us preachers have preached from Acts chapter 3, but today I want you to open your ears and eyes of faith to see what the Lord has in store for us as believers of today. Praise the name of the Lord. So it begins by saying now, after these things are, uh, these things are going on, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. I was keen to find out what was this hour of prayer. And the Bible says it is the ninth hour. That means that it was three o'clock and they were going to pray and to worship God in the temple. This is the same hour that Jesus Christ cried to the Father and asked, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? And he gave up his life for the sake of you, and myself. It is the hour that we need to reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in prayer and in commitment, in worship, as we lift our spirits to him and to get to know what is the will of God concerning our lives as believers of today. So at this particular hour, Peter, are going, uh, Peter and John are going to the temple and they are going there for the purposes of prayer. And I want to begin by saying that the act of the believers is the act of prayer, being sensitive to prayer. These people never just left it like that. Jesus taught them how to pray. Jesus even modeled prayer to them. These disciples knew that prayer was so important for them. And it, it just got into the inside of them such that even after Jesus went back to heaven, they continued with the acts of prayer. Praise the name of the Lord. I say it doesn't matter how many prayer conferences you have been to. If you have not taken the action yourself, the act of praying, it is in vain. It doesn't matter how many Holy Ghost anointed services of prayer we have attended and we have been to. It takes a person to make a decision to go and pray. 
You can go to the house of God and pray. You can pray on the way home. You can pray in your office. You can pray in your family. But you must have as a consistent life of prayer. I want to remind the church that prayer is a lifestyle. It is not a duty. I know Pastor Alan has called us on Tuesday to come here and pray. And he's about to call us to come for the overnight prayer. But we are not supposed to come as a duty. We are not supposed to come just because it is in the program of the church. Prayer must come out of a relationship that we have with Christ. A desire that comes from the inside of us, you know, desiring to be in the presence of the Lord, speaking to him, talking to him, and allowing him to talk to us. Praise the Lord. Prayer is a conversation. Prayer is talking and listening. Prayer is opening the inner eyes of faith to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us, the church of Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. Prayer is not complaining. Can you imagine if Peter and John were going to the temple to complain to the Lord? Can they, can they make it a routine? They cannot. Because if I know that I will be going somewhere to complain or to cry or to suffer, I will not go. But if they have been going every day from the time Jesus ascended, then it means that it was a place of relationship. It was a place of exchange. It was a place of emptying themselves to the Father and even releasing their spirits to worship Him. Praise the name of the Lord. So this Apostles continued in prayer. They continued in prayer and they went to the house of God to pray. And Jesus has taught us prayer. If you go to Matthew, you go to, to even Luke, you see the model prayer that Jesus gave to the disciples. And we are here also to learn from them. And we see also Paul preaching and encouraging the church to pray without ceasing. Many times we cease to pray. And I tell you, then we will not witness what the early church witnessed. If you study the lives of the apostles, they spent time praying. If you study the, the, the lives of the, the first, the second, and the third century believers who came after the apostles, they spent time praying. They spent time in the presence of the Lord. And no wonder the things they did are not even being done today. And so the, God is, the Lord is calling us to the place of prayer. Let me assure you that prayer is not easy. I don't know how many of you enjoy prayer. Prayer is labor. Prayer is like a woman who is expecting a child going to the labor ward. And you have no choice but to deliver. You really want to deliver this thing so that the pain gets off your body. I think I can explain it better because I went through that. Men, men tell us that they understand. I, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I'm not too sure that men understand what labor is. You do. But I tell you, when you're going to deliver a child, it is a time, I think two days ago, I went to the labor ward, and I listened, and it reminded me 19 years ago, when I had my last, last baby. I listened to what that woman was going through, and I said, it is time for prayer. It, this woman is in a place, in a defining time. And she cannot leave that hospital until she gets the baby. And many times as believers, we say, Sitoki hapa mpaka unibariki. Before the baby comes out, you're on your way home. Mtoto anatokea kwa njia. I want to call us back to the place of prayer, a place of waiting, a place of labor, a place where we wait until the Lord births revival in our lives, 
in our seasons, in our time. You know, the generation that we have today is a generation that needs to see the miracles of God. And they will not see if the church is not in labor. This world, our children may not have seen a demon being removed. And we need to labor. We need to go back to the labor world of prayer and push until a demon is removed and they can see for sure there is work that has happened. The Lord is calling us back to the place of prayer. How many of us are happy about what is going on in the country today? The economy. I don't know how much you're buying food for, but it is so surprising and so shocking. I don't know how much you're paying for the fuel, and we are being told that things will increase. I don't know increase to what. And surprisingly, the salaries are not increasing. So we need to go to the labor ward. It is not the time for cheap talk and discussing siasa and politics and doing things and talking about the government. It is the time for the church to get back to those rooms up there and birth something that the, the government will listen to. Praise the name of the Lord. It is the time for the church to lock themselves there. And call upon the name of the Lord. Do you know the church has the mandate to shape the economy of this country? Do you know the church has the mandate even to put leaders in place and remove leaders from place? And, and it will not happen if we are eating and getting satisfied. If we do not have a consistent life of prayer. You know, for them, it was known. Even the beggar knew, and that's why he was positioned there, that people go to the house of God to pray. And so, our lifestyles must be evident and must be seen. I know you're looking at me and you're telling me that Jesus said when you're praying, close yourself somewhere and pray so that you're not seen. I tell you, yes, he has said that. But he's, he's also calling us to a place where we practice prayer. It becomes part and parcel of us because the word of God has to be understood within its context. When Jesus is talking to the, to the apostles and the disciples and telling themselves, I mean them to lock themselves up and pray there. It's because prayer that time was prejudiced. Like, did you see me pray? Did you hear how many words I used in my prayer life? And he told them it is not about that. Lock yourself and pray. Because your father in heaven sees you and rewards you. But at this time, the lifestyle of prayer is so practical that it is evident even in the communities where we live, in the estates where we live. And the people know, even the beggars know, that there is a church here and that there are people who come to church on Sunday. There are people who come to church on Tuesday. There are people who come to church on Thursday. And they go there at the hour of prayer, consistency in prayer. And Jesus said, men ought to always pray and not faint. Paul told the, the church in Colossae uh, that devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. First Chronicles 16, 11, look to the Lord and his strength Seek his face always. And I need to ask myself, when was the last time I sought the Lord? In church, we are being called to the place of prayer. And therefore, if we are going to have the acts of the apostles, the acts of believers, we need to be sensitive to prayer. We need to hear God. You know, there is a woman in First Samuel, I always refer to her because she amazes me. The woman was called Hannah. She could go all the time to Shiloh every year to go 
and offer sacrifice to the Lord together with her family. She had a co-wife and a husband and the co-wife had children. Her, she didn't have children. And it was a routine thing to go to Shiloh and offer sacrifices. But it came a time of childbirth. It came a time of labor in prayer that when every other person was going to their boardroom to eat some meal, Hannah refused to go there. And she stood by the pillar of the temple and began to call upon the name of the Lord. She cried to the Lord. She prayed until words disappeared from her mouth. She started, you know, groaning in the spirit where her spirit was connected with the spirit of God. And she began to touch God with her prayer. Her lips were moving. But no words were coming out. She was not understood. And I always tell people, until you pray and nobody understands you, you have not prayed. We need to get to that place of prayer that everyone is, doesn't understand at all what we are doing. Even the priest of the day, Hannah's pastor didn't even know what was going on. Hannah's pastor didn't know what was going on. He looked at her and asked her, why are you drunk? At such a time as this, you are drunk. And I tell you something, that until you pray and you are not understood, you have not prayed. She said, I have never drunk from childhood, but I'm pouring my heart to the Lord. It was a defining time for Israel at that time. God is watching. Judges are rising. Others are leading the people into more idolatry. And God wants to change that regime and give Israel a prophet. And it will take a woman who can sense the seasons. It will take a man who can sense the seasons of God to pray in accordance with the will of God. No wonder Paul told the church in Rome that you need to pray in the spirit because the spirit helps us in groanings that we cannot utter. It is that period of prayer that things are done in the spiritual realm. And so they, they, they went to the, to the house of the Lord at the hour of prayer in verse number two. Verse number two, we see a man who was lame from birth. The Bible says he was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. I read this story and it blew my mind. This man, the next chapter tells us that he was 40 years old. This man was brought to the temple every time to come and beg for alms because he was lame and he was a beggar. So he could borrow from people going to the church. And this time comes when Peter and John in verse number three are going to the temple. He asked them, he looked at them and was ready to be given something for the day. And Peter and John gazed at him. I guess that gazing at somebody is looking at somebody in a different way. You know, it's like you are connecting to heaven, but you're looking at Pastor Jimmy. You're looking at him without removing your, your eyes from him. And you're, you, because God is downloading something in your spirit concerning his life. That is the gaze that... Really, I see in this scripture. So he gazed um, at them. They gazed at him. And Peter stood up. I want to tell us, church, it doesn't matter our differences. Peter was very talkative. Before you talk, he has talked everything. Sometimes I get tired of working with such people because they don't give you an opportunity even to say what you want to say. You start a sentence, they finish for you. Before you start, they have already said everything. And that was Peter for you. John was a quiet person like me. And so, they... 
They are walking to the temple and they are going there to pray. And Peter is already saying everything that there is. And so when they appear before God, because our moment with God really you know, leaves all our personalities and everything that we are carrying outside. This, that's why these two people could walk together. They walked, they left their differences outside and went to the house of God at the hour of prayer because prayer is about God. It's not about ourselves. I want to ask the church that we need to rise up and step up in prayer so that, I know that was my first point, but I forgot this statement, but we need to rise up in prayer and get out of ourselves. Prayer is about God. And that's why when Jesus was teaching them how to pray, he said, say our Father, because it's, it doesn't concern them, it concerns the Father. It doesn't concern the things that we need. It concerns the daily things that the Father knows that we need. That is prayer for you. And so they go to the house of God and they are sensitive to the Spirit. The man has been sitting there at the beautiful gate and borrowing alms from the people getting in. And so Peter stands up and says, I told you that Peter was very talkative. He said, look at us. And of course, this guy had to really pay attention to what Peter is saying. Look at us. And he says, gold and silver, have I none? I don't know what was going on in the mind of this beggar. But I imagine he was surprised. Everyone who has come to the temple has had gold and silver. What's, what's wrong with you preachers? Two broke Preachers with nothing. They didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. They were just walking to the temple without gold and silver. The cup is there for the beggar, but they cannot put anything right there. But I want to tell you something. They may not have had the gold and the silver, but they had something special. Amen. Only the church here understands what I am talking about. You know, let me tell you something. If you are going to be a church that is going to offer sol solutions to a lame world, you need to get above gold and silver and get to a level of such as I have. Because the world is lame and lost. They need something different. For 40 years, this guy is being given gold and silver. It doesn't change his situation at all. So he needed something different, something out of the ordinary, something that mere men cannot give. He needed something that is greater than gold and silver, something more expensive than gold. He needed something valuable. You're not hearing me. But I will preach anyway. The church is carrying a solution to the people, but we do not understand our potential. This world has never seen a miracle, and God is calling upon you and myself to display the greatness of God. He says, gold and silver, have I none? The guy is shocked. But immediately, Peter says, such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That is all that that man needed. Do you know, sometimes I have come to know that even our current situations are as a result of some lameness in our lives, some blindness in our lives some imprisonment in our lives. Probably you have been begging from January to December. You do not need gold and silver. You need such as I have. Because it is until you are liberated that you can now have silver. Even make silver and gold yourself. There are some people who need freedom. 
so that they can rise up from where they have been sitting and get somewhere and make things that have never been made. But it will take you, the living church of Jesus Christ, to do that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I heard of a story and I shared with the first and second service of two preachers who were just having a discussion. One was older, the other one was younger. And so they are just talking about what they have. Today's preachers are different from some years back preachers. If you have lived a few years like me, you know how the preachers used to look like. One coat for every trouser on Sunday. No money in their pockets, no offering, nothing. They didn't have gold and silver. That coat had been washed in the river until it has changed color, until the things that make the coat in the inside. One time I was a designer and I know the things that are put inside the clothes. So they come out and the, the thing hangs like this. Mbaka mchungaji anakani kama amebeba changarawe na koti. On these sides, they are carrying heavy, it, it looks heavy. But I tell you, they were the movers and shakers of that time. They didn't have the gold that today's preachers have. But I tell you, they had such as I have that today's preachers don't have. So the younger preacher, you know, the older preacher tells the younger preacher that, you know, these are not the days of gold and silver we do not have. There's a lot of gold today. The, the young preacher, battle lacks pastor, feeling very good. <laughs> pastor Joe, you know, when you look at that suit that he's wearing today, that one is a very expensive suit. And he does not understand these things of gold and silver have I none. And these things of hanging coats like this. He does not understand. He doesn't understand washing the coat in the river. He knows going to the laundry and having it laundered. And so he does not understand. And he's, you know, the preacher is telling him. You know, those days when there is no gold and silver, he does not understand and he's putting a smile. So the younger preacher told the older preacher, Preacher man, these are not the days of silver and gold, have I none? And the older preacher looked at the younger preacher and said, neither are they the days of such as I have. Do you get the difference? Yes. So today's preacher does not understand trouble because they are not seeking God. You know, you seek God properly when you have a problem. But when everything is put on the table, you don't have need for God. Actually, it is God who needs you. Yes, Bishop Gichu, uh, Gichuki, such that you feel if I don't go to church, the church does not profit because gold and silver you have. I tell you, it is us who need God. It is not God who needs us because God can use the stone to do his will. God can use an animal to do his will. God can use anything. And therefore it is us who need God. So they may not be the times of gold and silver have I none. But they are not also the times of such as I have I give to you. The miracles that we are seeing today, if they are miracles, are fake things. A preacher stands here. And before they perform a miracle, do you even know when you are performing a miracle? They have already called all the cameramen in the world and asked for all the microphones to be brought. Uh -huh, tell us, you've been sitting there for how long? Tell us, 40 years. Uh -huh. What has been happening? You know, I've been having a cup here and I've been begging from these, these believers who are going to the house of... Uh -huh. And then, you know, this and that. Eh, what happened today? When I came, what happened? Shindwe, katika jina la Yesu. We are supposed to spread the kingdom of heaven. God is not asking us to display our kingdom. He is asking us to display his kingdom. 
praise the name of the Lord. Actually, if they had not seen the guy come to church, they wouldn't have known that a miracle had taken place. So this thing of calling everyone and every media and everything to come, and some of the times embarrassing people, I tell you, it is not biblical. And if you find it, uh, educate me. The miracle was done at the gate. And you know, sometimes I read that scripture and I, I, was, I was telling God to forgive me. Because many times, church, we are not sensitive to the spirit of God. You come to church, you find a beggar out there. They are begging for something. The solution is you. You are the one who is carrying the solution for that person. And you are in a hurry. You know, in a hurry because worship will end. It is a time for prayer. Don't you know that we pray at three o'clock? You leave that beggar there when you are carrying the solution for them. Rushing to come and preach. God is calling us to a place of being sensitive. In the spirit. Handling the beggar out there. And coming with him to the church. No, you didn't hear me. There are so many blind people out there. Just because we are in a hurry to perform our religious duties in church. Let me tell you, Pastor Naomi. Amen in Jesus' name. Even if you don't come and sing. God will raise somebody else to sing. You better be in the place where God wants you to be than being in the place where you want to be. Yes, I know you want to come here and hold the microphone and sing, but the Lord wants you to minister to the beggar. And we have missed opportunities. The beggars are still sitting outside because we are not sensitive in the spirit. We are rushing to come and preach. And leaving them out there. The Lord is calling us to the acts of believers. Amen. Not the shows that we are having today. Peter and John paid attention to the beggar. And said, such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they didn't finish at that. They were not in a hurry. They held the man. They helped him up. They held him so strongly until the ankles and the feet received their strength. The problem that we have with believers is that we are so much in a hurry. It is a hit and run for as long as you have said. You don't even watch there because you are not confident. You are asking yourself, Nakikata kutembe, nitamuambia nini? Because we lack faith. We've not stayed with the Lord enough to know what the Lord wants. Let me tell you, if our generation is going to see true miracles, we have to sit in the prayer room. We have to have our quiet time. We have to sit with the Father and get to know the will of the Father. The apostles were people like us. The early church, the bishops of the age, they were people like us. And the Bible truly tells us that Elijah was a man like you and myself. And he prayed that there should be no rain for three and a half years. And there was no rain. And again he prayed and the earth, the heavens released the rain. If Elijah was a man like Joyce, why is it that I cannot bring rain? It is a call to step up in prayer. Amen. Such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There are so many crippled people, crippled by sin, that need to hear the gospel. But as we are comfortably here, I want to encourage all of us. I know your seat is too good. But you need to rise up from that seat and get to a beggar out there. Get the gospel to the lost world. You are the one carrying a solution for a lame world. And it is until you go 
Blessed is the man who carries the good news and takes them out there to the mountains, to the valleys, to everyone that needs it. There are people who need deliverance. It will take you being sensitive in the spirit to go there and deliver those people. This man was helped up and he was able to jump. He jumped, he leaped, he praised God. And he never went home. He came to the house like every other man has been coming to the house. Can you imagine how many people out there are bound? They really desire to come here and get to know what happens here. But they can't. They are still bound. It's because we have become those professional worshippers. Dead church where there are no signs, there are no miracles, there are no wonders because we are not sensitive to the Spirit. God is calling us to a higher level. God is calling us to offer solutions to a dying world. Praise the name of the Lord. And you know, when they did that, the men of that time were amazed. They looked at them in amazement. And Peter, again, I told you there are people that you don't want to walk with, but you can also decide to walk with them. He stood up very fast and said, why are you looking at us? Sometimes it's good to walk with Peter, to speak for you. You know, he said, why are you looking at us like that? Like it is by our own strength that we were able to heal the man. And he took that as an opportunity for the gospel. He didn't call the the speakers to come, the microphones and the cameras to come. He talked to them and said, you know, this Jesus that has been prophesied, this Jesus that has been prophesied, this Jesus that was revealed to you and you crucified him in his name, this man is walking. Let me tell you, if we are preaching the gospel that does not carry the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is entertainment. Our gospel must be pegged on the prophecy. And the revealed prophecy in Jesus Christ, the one that was witnessed by the apostles of the day, that is the gospel. Praise the name of the Lord. He talked to them, the Pharisees, who were ready now to attack, and told them, that man that you crucified, it is in his name that this man is walking. I want to ask the church that even if we are going to rise up, become sensitive in prayer, sensitive in the spirit, carry the word of God, and see miracles happening, don't stand there to receive the glory. Move away. By the way, did you hear a scripture that says God does not share the glory, his glory with any man? Did you hear another one that says that God is a consuming fire? I think some of us are getting consumed today. Preachers who are stand, starting today, very, they started very well, but they are ending badly. Because they have stood in the place of God. We have always wanted people to see us and to see the power that we carry come to me when i lay my hand on you let me tell you this hand is a dead thing if the spirit of god is not upon it and therefore the person to receive the glory is god i told the church as i come to church every day i see a signpost they are written gospel centers international that signpost has never come here. It doesn't know where GCI is. It is as who know, and we have put it there to direct those who do not know, right? It has never been here. That signpost has never seen me standing here, but it directs people here. I want to tell you, believer, you are a signpost. Get out of the way of the Lord and let people come to the Lord. You stand there to direct. And stand outside. Allow the Father to receive the glory. Because left alone you and me, there is nothing you can do. 
give God the glory because he is the author of miracles. He's the one who is opening the eyes of the blind. He's the one who is lifting up the beggars, the, the lame people, and the suffering people. He's the one removing the demons. It is not you. So every other thing that has hung around, just get it out of the way and allow people to see Christ. Many times people have not seen the Messiah because we are standing there and we are blocking them. Let us get out of the way and allow him to do. The acts of the believers is one of them is not to take the glory, to do the work, to allow the Lord to use us and get out of the way. So if we are going to see a generation that is experiencing the move of God and the power of God, then we must be like the believers of that time. Praise the name of the Lord. As I bring this to a conclusion, I just want to tell us that we are living in a time and a season where you cannot differentiate a believer from an unbeliever. Because the believer knows that they are born again, but they behave like non-believers. When they get a gift that is wrapped and coated nicely, and they know for sure it is sinful, it does not please the Father, they still go for it. How many believers today do we see who are living lives that are unrighteous, adultery, immorality, stealing, bribing? How many believers are in that category? The Lord is asking us to step up in faith and live like believers. He's calling us back to the prayer room where he's going to smash us. He's going to beat our physical bodies. He's going to kill our physical bodies and allow Christ to live in us. You know, it is not just a memory verse where you walk and say, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ living in me. And you are adult, an adulterous person. Is Christ an adulterer? So it is you that liveth. It is not a memory verse. It is action, that it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me. And for sure, when we look at you, we see a dead person. If you are still rising up to fight the person who is fighting you, you are so much alive. You need to die. Remind yourself that you are supposed to be dead, so that Christ can live in you. Praise the name of the Lord. And the non-believers that we are having, they are the ones who are quoting scriptures. I met one, and as I, went, uh, as I was just getting ready to witness to him, he said, I know the Bible. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, you do not know him. But you know the word. <laughs> I want to tell you that this, you, you know, it will take a few people who have known who they are to become true believers. We need to step into the world and bring a difference. We need to be different from every other person. Are you visible in the world that you're living in today? Are you able to pay attention to the dying world and give them a solution? Are you able to get out of the way and allow God to be God in that situation? Can the world feel us as the church? Can they see us? Can they hear us? Can their situations change? Because we are visible. Let us rise up on our feet as we think about these things and as we ask the Lord to help us.